Now, for those like me who know the history of the strength and conditioning profession, everyone says, well, what about Alvin Roy? I knew Alvin. I hitchhiked to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to train at Alvin Roy's facility on Oklahoma Avenue because Jimmy Taylor trained there. A guy that I knew well, Joe Don Looney, trained there. And they said, you got to get down here. I was a young guy. I was a sophomore in college, and I hitchhiked down there, not knowing anything. And I slept in an outdoor shed with, with feral cats, with a cat allergy, just so I could be there for four or five days and watch these pro guys lift weights. I mean, this to me was like the greatest thing that ever happened. The very first full-time official strength and conditioning coach anywhere was this man, Boyd Epley. Boyd was, a, Boyd was a track and field guy. Paul Walter went to Phoenix area, Phoenix Junior College, you know, not community college, junior college. And that area, in an area where guys didn't lift a lot of weights, they had a weightlifting type of tradition. Wayne Coleman had come through that area, great discus thrower, but you know him as superstar Billy Graham, the wrestler. I knew him as Wayne Coleman, because he also played uh, football in the Atlantic Coast Football League when I was there. Uh, Boyd lifted weights, guys didn't lift weights. Boyd looked like a bodybuilder, but was an athlete, did it for athletic improvement. Um, injured his back a senior year, went to the football coaches and said, you know, we don't have a lot of strong guys. Uh, they could do what I'm doing and they could get stronger, we'd be better. And the coaches are going, oh God, we'll have muscle bound athletes tearing their muscles. They acquiesced, I don't know if it was Coach Osborne who really pushed it, but the bottom line is, he's the first. He is the first. From there, I think he sent more guys into the field than any 15 guys combined. Because not only was it the, he was the first, as you would expect, passionate, a believer, shot full of energy. This is what we're going to do. We are going to strength train. You guys are going to get stronger. I'll show you how to do it. You got to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. Do it. And the results, for anyone who knows the history of Oklahoma football, I mean the Nebraska football, they usurped Oklahoma's place as the premier program after they started lifting weights. Okay, they had, hey, they were very good under Coach Devaney. They had a couple of down years under Coach Devaney. Boyd got in there, not strictly for him. The coaches went out and did some good recruiting, had a great staff, and boom, they, were, they, they ascended. And they stayed ascended. And he pushed it and pushed it and he developed equipment, being a guy with great passion and great knowledge. He designed a tremendous amount of equipment and in fact teamed up with Hammer Strength to come up with the ground base idea and the ground base equipment. You know, and that was groundbreaking. But again, someone's got to be first. He's the first in a lot of areas. He developed some squat racks, the half rack. Everyone's got a half rack. Well, you weren't going to have it if he didn't develop it and draw it out and design it. That's a fact. You want adjustable racks on your on your bench press so that you can adjust the height. Well, someone had to come up from that. That all this stuff came out of Boyd's program. Okay, he changed the face of college football. Literally changed not only the face of the profession. He invented a profession. And that's your profession. This is the number one guy, Boyd Epley. Thank you, Dr. Ken. Thank you, Dr. Ken. Wow, what an introduction. That's the best introduction I've ever had. Thank you very much. Unbelievable. You gave half my speech to you. But that's okay. Well, years ago, I did something right. I named our strength program Husker Power. And most people don't take time to name their strength program because it's part of an athletic department. You just don't have that kind of uh, need. But I felt like I needed to do that, and it uh, it was a big thing. And it's still this logo is recognized throughout the world today as uh, 
what it is, a strength and conditioning department. But anyway, I do have a connection to Hammer Strength in a lot of ways. You know, by now you probably realize that this clinic is in its 25th anniversary. I don't know if they've been telling you that or not. It's not on this sheet behind me, but it's on some of the materials. I was asked to speak at that first convention, or first clinic, and also the second one. And so, um, from those days, uh, they sent me a double chest press, a double incline, and um, wanted me to. You know, I was a freeway guy, as a lot of people back in those days were freeway guys. Nautilus had come out, but a lot of people didn't buy into that, and they were still freeway guys. And I was one of those. And so. Hammer Strength folks wanted to get a machine into Nebraska, so they sent me a free double chest press or double incline, whatever they were calling it. They called things different than I did. But after a couple of weeks, the salesman called back. He says, how's the double incline doing? I said, it's broken. He said, how can it be broken? It's got two pivot points. The arms go up and down. There's, there's nothing there to break. I said, well, it's got something wrong with it. He said, well, what's wrong with it? I said, it's got a seat on it. He goes, got a seat on it. All of our machines, all of our hammer strength machines have seats on them. I said, that's what's wrong with hammer strength. You need to get rid of those seats. We don't play football sitting down. In fact, you don't play very many sports sitting down. You got to be on your feet when you train. So then I get a call from the designer and probably part owner. I'm not sure what the relationship there is, but Gary Jones, Arthur Jones' son, who designs the hammer strength machines. I get a call from him and he says, what are you doing? And so he invites me to come to Cincinnati here, across the river is their factory. And they took one of those machines that cut the seat off, raised it up and created the hammer jammer. I don't see any jammers in this weight room, but the jammer became their number one selling machine for multiple years. And uh, it had quite an impact because for like an offensive lineman, you could just explode out safely. You could still do a push press or something overhead, but it wasn't as safe. So the jammer was a big deal. And uh, it then led to uh, other push-pull machines that you could push and rotate. And um, in fact, we have six of them. Those then led to some other ground-based machines like the RDL machine. They have different names for them. But uh, they, could, they basically made enough machines that were ground-based that I could put together a ground-based circuit. And that metabolic circuit, I don't know if you've tried it, it's been out there for 20, 25 years. Mike Arthur says it produces more muscle development than any other program that we've ever researched. And it's machines. So a free weight guy finally bought into machines to be able to produce muscle. And it really, they really do work, and especially this metabolic circuit. Another thing that uh, Tom Prophet did, Tom is uh, one of the driving forces in hammer strength and always has been. In 2000, I wasn't real happy with where the NSCA was, even though I was the founder of the organization. They were kind of going more of a medical direction. They had a president that was an athletic trainer, and the next guy in line was a physical therapist. And they were trying to get strength coaches to be part of a medical team. So Chuck Stiggins was kind of leading a group to, to break away from the NSCA. I went to the meeting out in Denver to kind of try to talk them out of it. But within a few minutes, I was on their board of directors. And, uh, and so we needed to get these people together somewhere uh, and could make some decisions. So I asked Tom to help. We had 10 board members that needed to get together and kind of write the rules of the organization. And Hammer Strength through Tom Prophet made that happen. And the 10 guys went out to uh, Salt Lake City and we got a lot done. And that organization is now in its 17th year. Then also, uh, Hammer Strength just this year redid the world headquarters for the NSCA in Colorado Springs, all new equipment. So if you ever get out to Colorado Springs, they got a hockey clinic coming up here June, June 9th and 10th. It would be a good opportunity to see that, that facility. So my history with Hammer Strength is quite extensive and been very positive and uh, a lot of good things. But what I want to talk to you about tonight is really Husker Power. 
and kind of the things that I've learned, you know, in, in two years, August 15, 2019, Husker Power will celebrate 50 years. That's going to be a pretty big deal for us. 50 years, that means I'm older than hell. That's right, I'll be 70 in a few days. But anyway, Husker Power was established in 1969. But I want to go back a little further. And I want to take a look at why did Nebraska need a strength program? And why did they feel like they needed to hire somebody to get a strength training program put in place? So we're going to take a look back at Bob Devaney, who was the head coach and the athletic director back then, and see what was going on there. But first, I'm going to tell you some other things. First, I'm going to tell you some things that I think should be in everybody's program. Okay, and if you've followed any of my literature through the years, you'll see that these four steps are kind of a system, a system that works. If you are not testing your athletes, then I feel sorry for you because you don't know where the hell they are physically. You have to test to find out where they are. Then you've got to set some goals after you learn what, what it looks like, what the test data looks like, to try to get better. Then the program, of course, is the most important thing. But the program needs to also have a retest. So let's say you're going to do a six weeks or eight weeks or 12 week training program and you have tested and now you retest to see what the results are. If your athletes don't make progress, guess what? Your program sucks. And that is exactly what happens to some strength coaches. They get in there and work the hell out of these kids. And at the end, when they test, they make no progress. In fact, some of them get worse. And if that's happening to you, you're doing something wrong. Every single athlete should improve in speed or power or some, some area that you're trying to develop if you're doing it right. When, when I retired from Nebraska after 35 years as the head strength coach and I, I went to the NSA headquarters in Colorado Springs, they were excited in that training facility about one inch vertical jump gains after six, eight weeks. I go, what the hell? If you aren't making seven, eight inch gains and you're not doing something right, I'm telling you, you can expect more. So the testing is very critical to let you know the roadmap of where you're at, where you're going, whether you're close or whether you're off base. Okay. Now some other things, if you need some help with that, this is my address. It's a website. You can go there and you can contact me from there and ask me whatever you want and I will get back to you. It might take a while. But I will get back to you if you if you want. Okay, so now I'm going to take a look a little bit at, at step four, the program. There's some important things that have to happen in your program. And you've got some really good speakers here at this clinic, so you're going to learn a lot about some of these things in different ways. So I'm not going to go into every one of them in detail, but a couple of them I think are worth noting. These are the things that have to be in every one of your programs if you're working with power sports. If you're a cross country runner, maybe that's different, but most of you are working with power sports. The reason that you send athletes to the weight room, many of you sitting in these chairs right now don't really understand why you are sending them to the weight room. Many of you would answer, if I asked you directly, I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody, you'd probably say, well, we want to get stronger, or we want to get faster. Your job is to put muscle on those athletes. Every muscle contraction is required before there's any movement. If I'm going to lift my arm up, that has got to be a muscular contraction involved. Your job is to improve those muscular contractions by putting more muscle on to make them more powerful, more forceful, to create better movement. Your job is to put on muscle. And a lot of you have never heard anybody tell you that before. And you're in this profession. So I'm doing it. And I'm going to show you some examples. Building muscle is the most important thing you can be doing. And if you're not measuring it, you're missing the boat. 
the ship sailed. Find a way, get a nurse, get somebody to come in and measure the body fat on your team. And what you want to do then is realize that our research shows that any improvement in the muscle will be an improvement in their performance scores. Any improvement in muscle. You should be putting on about five pounds of muscle in a training program five, six weeks long. Nebraska gained a thousand pounds of muscle in, in four and a half weeks of winter conditioning in 1991. That's like a whole different team. Any improvement comes about as a result of improving muscle. Now, you can't always keep your muscle up. During the season, you drop off. You, you actually lose muscle. In the off season, you got, for, if you're a football coach, you got the winter and you got the summer. During the season, you're not gonna be able to put much muscle on. It just doesn't work that way. You're gonna be uh, doing too much. So what we wanna do is have you measure your body fat Let's say uh, <clears throat> this gentleman here in the front row, I'm going to say he weighs 200 pounds. He looks like bigger than that, but let's say he weighs 200, and let's say he's 10% fat, which he's not, but let's say that, okay? Well, how much fat does he have if he weighs 200 and he's 10% fat? Come on, math majors, Indiana over here. All right, 20 pounds of fat, right? Okay, so if I was to tell one of your athletes say, hey, you got 20 pounds of fat, what are they going to do? They're going to run to a treadmill and start doing some aerobic exercise to try to get that fat down. And that is a mistake. And this is something that I've learned in my whole career here that I want you to get right. That is the opposite of what you should be doing. What you need to do is take that 20 pounds away from what he weighs and really look at what he really actually weighs. Be 180 pounds. Now, the 180 pounds is the strength-producing property that he possesses right, right now. And you want to try to increase that. You want to try to increase the muscle. Don't worry about the fat. Health clubs, if you're at a health club, is way too much focus on reducing fat. If you're dealing with athletes, your job is to build muscle. Forget the fat. It will melt away as you build the muscle. Focus on putting on that muscle so that the next time you test, they have more muscle, and if, you, if they do, they will run faster, jump higher, and have better change of direction, I promise you. All right? Here's an example of a guy who weighed 227 as a freshman. As a senior, he weighed 268. So those of you who are not testing body fat, all that information is telling us is that the guy gained 41 pounds. That is nothing. That tells me nothing. What really happened to this guy is he weighed 210. He gained 36 pounds of muscle and won the Outland Trophy. Now I got something I can use. How much muscle? If you can gain 36 pounds of muscle in your career, you're not going to be the same kid. The goal for linemen when I was at Nebraska, they haven't done much since I left, and I'm going to explain why. The goal at Nebraska when I was there is to have 14 or 15 linemen that weighed 250 pounds of muscle or more. Now let's say this gentleman I'm picking on here actually weighs 300 pounds and he's 20% fat. He's not big enough. That means he's carrying 60 pounds of fat, and he only weighs 240, and I'm looking for kids that are 250 or more. Now you start to get the idea how you're supposed to be looking at athletes? Forget what they weigh. Find out what it's made of. Got it? That's a real big one. You need to get that right. Example. At the top, here's a, any, again, any gain in lean body mass, is, a, is physical improvement. It is. Here's a guy that gained 49 pounds of muscle in his career. You're probably not going to see that. That's, that's a freak. That's rare. Here's a guy that gained 28 pounds in one year. That's extreme. All right? See what you can accomplish. All right, now we're going to move on. It's hard for you to read these little things up here in the corner. 
but it's kind of a reminder of the things I think we need to work on. Building muscle, developing strength and power, developing speed and agility, and training in the correct energy system. So I've got a little example here for you. It's not going to work for everybody. Maybe none of you, I don't know. But what I would recommend is you do explosive lifting twice a week. Then you add slow movements twice a week. So let's say explosive lifting is Monday and Thursday. Slow movements Tuesday, Friday. That gives you two days to recover from either of those. I know people that do both explosive and slow on the same day, and they don't make any gains. Your body has fast and slow twitch fibers both, and if you do it this way, they will both get better, and your recovery is unbelievable. You got two or three days between. On the weekend, you got three days recovery. Okay, now the key to what I'm showing you here is not to run until week five. And most of you just go, what the hell? We got summer conditioning starting June 5th. We're going to run the hell out of them. And you won't make any muscle gains. We had a high school kid die June, it was a June 9th that summer was the first day. And a guy tried to do all this on the first day. Killed a high school kid. Listen to me. You, you need to not run for a month. And you will see incredible physical development that you have never seen in your life. That is the key to my success. And I had to fight those football coaches tooth and nail every day. The receivers coach, the defensive back coach, every day. They were gentlemen. I wish I could say I was. And then you, two weeks later, you add some agility drills. And the last four weeks, this is a 12-week recommended, recommended program for you. Then you do your conditioning. Why the hell would you need to be in the best shape of your life in June if you're not going to play a game till August or September? Why? Think about that. Okay? Of course, you want to do performance testing before and after. And then you want to measure strength every four weeks. That is a standard program that I've recommended for years, and I guarantee you it will work. I guarantee it. There's thousands of high schools that have done this program. This is guaranteed. It's not something somebody made up. It's been proven to work. The key to this is not running. Now, that's not going to sit well with, with a pretty large number of you. I know that. but. Now, I've been at this a long time, and that's probably the strongest recommendation I can make to you. Running melts away your gains. It's the worst thing you can do if you're trying to put on muscle. The worst. Okay? All right, now I want to tell you about this guy. This is Bob Devaney. He's the one that kind of started this, and he had a reason. He had a problem. Nebraska had seven losing seasons in a row and they hired Bob Devaney from Wyoming he went nine and two the first year ten and one nine and two ten and one nine and two this guy could coach he took a bunch of losers and turned them into winners overnight but then he went six and four and six and four and what had happened was he had some advisors a trainer an assistant track coach and some people that he relied on that told him he needed to do distance running. Now, what did I just tell you? They weren't lifting weights back then. But around the country, there were a few people lifting here and there. Alvin Roy existed in 63 or so, but there were very few people around the country that actually were lifting weights. Nebraska was not. And now, on top of that, they're running. So they lost an average of 10 to 15 pounds per person. They couldn't push anybody around. It's kind of what's happened to them in the last few years. And I'll explain that. So what was missing at Nebraska? They had no program to build muscle. They weren't doing any strength or power. Did not have a single person lifting, except a few injured guys. They weren't really trained in speed and agility. They were trained in endurance. Endurance in the wrong energy system. 
No wonder they weren't winning. And that might very well be happening to you right now. If you're doing any distance running, you need to cut that out if you're working with football. Most sports, if you want to volleyball, you don't run. Even basketball has very little endurance associated with it. You think it does, but it doesn't. These are the things that you need to be looking at, okay? So we talked about building muscle. I'm not going to get into the strength so much. I'll mention that uh, Charlie Green was my roommate in, high, in uh, college at Nebraska. He was lifting weights with me. I was a pole vaulter, and he was the world record holder in the 100-yard dash. And he was lifting secretly. The coaches uh, didn't know it. In 1967, a football player at Marquette University got kicked off the football team for lifting weights. And so nobody was really into this as an, organ as an organized thing. But Charlie loved it, and uh, he went on and, and uh, went to the Olympic Games in 68 and won a, a bronze medal and a gold medal. Charlie Green. At that time, in 1968, there were a pocket of people lifting around the country. The world record in the shot put in 1950, by 1968, there were 50 people that had thrown over 13 feet farther than the world record in 1950 because they started lifting weights. It's like magic, but you can screw it up with all this running. I'm, I'm going to harp on that till I die. All right? So. It wasn't until 1988 when Mike Stone did the research to show that you do not need an aerobic base for football. There is no aerobic component in football. And yet we have coaches that think you've got to have mental toughness and you've got to run these guys. It's, it's a joke. So it took me a long time to get all of our coaches on board. So what Nebraska needed was what I talked about there. They needed a strength program to give them the ability to develop players, to gain size and strength. And so it was a perfect opportunity for me to come along and help them because they were screwing up. So this Devaney guy gave it a chance, and I'm forever indebted to him. It was at the urging of Tom Osborne, who, who replaced Devaney as a head coach later on. But anyway... Um, Devaney told me, okay, we're going to give this a try, but if anyone gets slower, you're fired. So that scared me a little, but they didn't. They got faster, and you know that. When you lift, you have the ability to get faster if you don't screw it up. Nebraska had been beaten by Oklahoma 47 to nothing on national TV at the end of the 68 season. They got beat by Kansas and Kansas State. And uh, during my career, we never lost to Kansas or Kansas State. Well, excuse me, we did lose to Kansas State uh, after 29 years. But anyway, uh, there were teams that shouldn't be beating Nebraska back then. Um, Oklahoma, though, was a very solid program. And beating Nebraska 47 to nothing on national TV caused Devaney to have his job at risk. So he was about to get fired, and he was going to try anything. So this Epley guy wants to have him lift weights, fine, we'll try it, whatever. Whatever you want, okay. Well, they lifted, and next year we played Oklahoma in Norman. And Oklahoma scored first, and then we outscored them 44-7. to The next year we won the national championship. The next year we won the national championship. We were ranked in the top 10 20 years in a row, my first 20 years. We kicked ass. I retired after 35 years. We had accomplished 356 wins. Every single player that I worked with had a championship ring. They have not won a championship since. The guy that replaced me started having the lineman run two miles. Backs and ends three miles. I know what I'm talking about. Got it? 
All right, what I did basically was I eliminated the endurance stations. I put rest intervals in the stations and between the stations. Coaches at that time were making people run to the next station. Run over here, run over here, run over here, get over here. <laughs> they, and some people today are having people lift. You got these half racks back here. They do a squat and then run over and do a push-up. That is insane. You need recovery. Recovery is the most important thing your body can do. Give it a chance. Endurance is not part of football. A play only lasts five to six, maybe seven seconds at the most. you got to be able to handle that. Within 30 seconds, your tank refills. So why the hell do you need endurance? You need power. Get that right. You don't need endurance in football. The fourth quarter is the same as the first quarter. you got basically 80 plays with a bunch of rest intervals in between. When they call timeout or the defense goes in or the offense, your tank refills. So anyway, it's frustrating to see people still screwing that up. So these are the things that I wanted you to have. Now we're going to talk a little bit about strength and power and then speed and agility. Uh, not a lot, though. I'm just going to say this. The fastest way to improve performance is to squat. And you can argue with that all you want. You're never going to change my mind. The squat is the number one exercise you can do. Now, Hammer Strength has a machine called a V-squat. And we've found that that can put muscle on, too. So um, if you don't want to squat, we'll have you a V-squat. And people do make great gains with that. But I'm still in favor of the squat. This is my son here. And my son's going to show you some pictures. But first I'm going to show you the original squat rack at Nebraska is on the is on the left here. They had a sale at some health club and the trainer went down and bought that Paramount squat rack. Can you imagine? We had Rich Glover, Johnny Rogers, Willie Harper. We had seven All-Americans on one team training on that squat rack. <laughs> so finally they tore down uh, they moved a road to make a bigger baseball area and I went out and got the fence posts and made racks out of these blue uh, racks. That was our first kind of a rack. It, it was not very good, but it was our first one. So anyway, we developed a half rack in 1996 and that's what you see in this picture here. These are also over here all half racks and up on that record platform are half racks. And the half rack now has grown taller and has all these attachments on it. And I'm, I'm afraid that that's actually kind of hurt the industry because you used to coach and now you just run them in and yell at them and run them out. You get, everybody has to have everything at every station. That's ridiculous. That's not the, what I would do. What I would do is have an expert coach in an area and you go into that area and you get done what you need, whether it's explosive or whether it's slow. And you don't do everything on the half rack, but that's where it's at. That's where all the high schools and colleges are today. They got competition to see who can get the most half racks. The only reason it's called a half rack is I couldn't think of a better name. It only had two posts instead of four. Anyway, here's your squat. The one in the green, I don't know if you can see these very well. It's the same guy, but the one in the green is doing this right. All right, so you want to keep the angles the same. And you see the one in the red with the big arch in the back? If that's you, you're going to have problems. That puts you in extension. You don't have use of your powerful hip muscles. You need to not have your head up. You need to be looking forward. You need to have those angles the same. And that's the way you're supposed to be squatting. I don't know where the hell all this other crap comes from. But there is a lot of ugly squat form out there. Pay attention to that. If you want it, write me. I will send you this picture. I'll send you this what I can. You know, there's some size limits, but I will send you this picture for sure. You need to do this right. This is my son who's a strength coach at Michigan. And he had, before he did this, he had injured himself going down a mountain skiing and had a compound fracture and a radial fracture in his left leg. And completely healed and has perfect squat form. All right, then the, to build power, I talked about the jammer. When I left Nebraska, 
there's a picture with six jammers. I come back eight years later, the athletic director actually asked me back to Nebraska. I'm back there now. There were no jammers. What the shit? I found two in storage. They're back in the weight room now. So anyway, I want to focus not so much on speed. Let, me, let some other speaker do that. I want to focus on agility because in recruiting, most every coach is looking for speed. And what they should be looking for is agility. Even you are thinking, what's he talking about? you got to have speed. Okay, yeah. But if you don't have agility, you're going to get your ass beat. Think of Michael Vick or Barry Sanders. People with incredible agility are the superstars in their sport. So what you should be doing is doubling up on agility drills, recruiting kids with agility, and they'll have the speed too. This is the best agility run I've ever seen in my life. This is Brian Shaw, 3.71 seconds. So if you got anybody that can beat that, I'd sure love to know about it. And that's 20 years old. 3.71 seconds electronic. Brian Shaw. Game speed is more about changing the direction than it is straight ahead speed. Every one of you on your, if you're a football guy, every one of you has a guy on your squad that, 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 that's a football player that you say, well, he's a track guy. Why would you say that? Because he can run fast, but he can't play football very well. You're not looking for the fastest guy. You're looking for a guy that can change direction. I'm going to show you some slides here. This is Tommy Frazier, a quarterback that's not very fast in terms of quarterbacks, but he just outran that entire team. And the reason he did that, he's, he has this triple extension going where he plants his foot, uses his ankle, knee, and hip to change directions. I'm going to show it to you again. First of all, if you look at this blue line, that's how many feet per second he's traveling. He would run about a 4.63 40-yard dash. The red line is what happens on this particular play. He never reaches top speed. That red line never reaches the same speed that the blue line does. In other words, in a football game, you don't reach top speed. You get tackled. What you need is a burst. You need to change direction at a burst. The linemen, they're not going to get to that white line. See what I'm saying? So let's take a look at that play again. Here he comes this direction. There's a triple extension right there. Right there, there's a big one right there. That extension is letting him change direction on the field and, and avoid the tackle. Let's take a look at this guy. This number 72 here is going to make contact with this Wyoming guy and knock him back eight yards. What's happening there, watch that blue line. See that? What happen, what's happening there is he's using that triple extension to extend, and he only has about two hundredths of a second to apply force to that person he's going to block. The same amount of time it takes to do a hang clean. Burst. So watch him again. He's going to come around here and burst. Is that what you're looking for? Is that what you got? All right, some of these films are, are real old because I'm old. But this is what we developed at Nebraska when we did it right. Watch this, watch this walk on fullback here. This guy right here is going to knock a linebacker who went to the NFL and had a great career. Knock him back, knock his helmet off and everything. There's a better view of it right here. Number 45 is a walk-on fullback. Triple extension, drive up through him. What do you think? Okay, more agility. Watch number seven here in the end zone. He's about to get tackled in the, in for a safety. Zoop. Okay, so now, now he's fast. Now you can say he's fast. He didn't outrun those people with his speed. He outran them with his agility. You get the point? You get that? I hope I've changed some minds here tonight. It's not about speed. It's about agility. It's not about endurance. 
ever. It's about putting on muscle. And when you get stronger legs, guess what improves the most? Your agility. Because you have the strength in those legs to make the change in directions. Kyle Vandenbosch could squat 465 for 10 and a minute later do it again and a minute later do it again in a circuit. And his agility was just unbelievable. All right. You can't really see all these, but when I came back to Nebraska, we reevaluated all of our principles. We have reevaluated everything we do. And I have, I'm very fortunate to have Mike Arthur there, who's a walking encyclopedia. And he's, uh, they moved his title and to Director of Strength and Conditioning Research. And so he is, has more books than all of you combined, I'm sure. And he is on top of it. And we're doing some things that I'm not sharing with you today because they're not quite ready. But I am sharing this. If you want to see the new principles, they're available free at huskers.com. You have to kind of look for the Husker power. You know, go to Husker, huskers, huskers.com and then look for Husker power. You'll find it. Okay? And then try to base your program on these principles. There's some latitude in there. There's a little flexibility in there. I'm trying to give back. Okay? Now, one other thing. Here's my address again if you need something. My wife has, for, when I went to the NSCA, um, huskerpower.com went away and I created something called Epic Athletic Performance. You can get to that from this address. There's a book, actually a couple books. There's a strength disc. But a couple things I wanted to tell you about. We have a new electronic timer. I had the Nebraska Engineering Department design it and it is awesome. You run and the time goes to your phone. It is awesome. For both sprints, I call it the Dasher. Dasher. Or Pro Agility. And there's a new jump station. It's not the Vertec with plastic veins that break. It's metal veins, and it's called the jump station. And that's right. It's awesome. Okay. I think I'm getting hungry. How about you guys? Should we go eat? Oh, by the way, this guy is the one that told me that I was the first paid college strength coach in history. In 1992 or three. I didn't know that. So he is quoted on the Husker Power website as the guy that uh, made that statement. Did you ever look at that? Did you ever notice? It's on there. It's on there right now. Okay, here you go, Ken. Okay, Boyd Epley. Right now you're sitting.